Hello everybody, my name is Richard Smith, I'm the director of the Tank Museum and today we're going to be thinking about why it is the question what is the best tank will be able to keep us arguing in pubs forever. Now the answer to the question what's the best tank is actually extremely easy. The answer is it depends what you want to use it for. But what we're going to think about today is we're going to dig in a little bit more into the question itself and in particular into what we mean by best. Now, as I've mentioned in my previous videos, I'm really interested in what we learn from people by looking at stuff and stuff is the essence of what museums do. The, the best talk I've ever heard about what a museum does was given by a chap called Headley Swain, who at the time was running uh, an organisation called the Museums, Libraries and Archives Council. And he gave a talk in which he said, when it boils down to it, museums are about great stuff. And I completely concur with that view of what a museum is. And museums act as a kind of global corporate memory where you can look at things and learn about the people and the cultures who made them. And my pitch to you today is that the definition of the best is actually driven not merely by functional requirements, but by the values and expectations of the people who make and design tanks in the first place. And I'm going to take three sets of examples to illustrate my point. So I'm going to take the British, obviously, uh, the Germans and the Russians. Uh, and through this talk, I'm going to use quite a lot of stereotypes. And stereotypes are, of course, hugely simplistic and imperfect. They're never going to describe everybody in a culture. However, they do tell us quite a lot about how a culture works and how people perceive a culture. And you know, if stereotypes didn't work at all, they wouldn't have any resonance. And so I think there is some value in them. And what we see in armoured vehicles is a physical manifestation of culture. And I'm really interested to uh, see in the comments of this video what people think about their own engineering cultures and what people value from different places and different perspectives. So really interested. Put those in your comments. I'd love to read them. Now, what all tanks have in common is that they're designed and made by engineers. Now, I'm a historian, I'm not an engineer, but I have spent my entire working life working really closely with engineers. And one of the conclusions I've reached is that engineers all over the world want the same thing. And that what engineers deep down everywhere want is the admiration of other engineers. Essentially, what they want is their engineering mates to think that they're a genius. Now, the challenge in each different place is that what genius looks like is culturally dependent and it depends where you're from. So let's look at my three examples and you can see for yourself if it makes any sense. So firstly, let's look at the British. As I said in my top five tanks a couple of days ago, I really like British First World War tanks. I think they illustrate beautifully what the British want from their engineers. You know, the, the, the most desirable trait for British engineers, the things that marks you out as a genius, the thing that they want to achieve more than anything else, is the appearance of effortless brilliance. So if you have to try... It doesn't count, or at least if you're seen to have to try, it doesn't count. The appearance of effortless brilliance underpins pretty much everything that counts as genius in British engineers. So if you look at some examples, uh, Little Willy, one of the examples I use in my top five, uh, is a tank that combines existing technologies. And there's a few tweaks, particularly on track design, but the technologies all exist, but they combine existing things into a brand new weapon system. Anyone could have done it before, but they didn't. It's an effortless stroke of brilliance is what we're looking at there. 
And similarly, one of my other favourite examples from British First World War tanks, they've got that rhomboid design shape of a British Mark I. It comes from the fact that the key problem in the design of Little Willie is actually getting across a gap. Because that, that rectangular shape of Little Willie, when it goes over a gap, tips in. The centre of gravity is actually uh, too far forward. And this is a real problem. But what they uh, did in the First World War is they took that same volume, roughly, and by taking it into a rhomboid, they shift the point at which the centre of gravity tips you into the trench. And those hordes, the front of the tank, is across the other side of the trench before it falls in. And just by a simple piece of geometrical calculation, they transform the effectiveness of the vehicle. This is, this is beautiful piece of design work. Uh, similarly, I used the example in my top five of the paintwork on the top of the whippet, uh, painting on extra vision slits to a tank to increase the number of targets, to reduce the number of German bullets that go to the right place is a stunning example of, of effortless appearance of brilliance. Um, and you can come up with any number of examples. Uh, the, the best examples all, of course, come from the Dan Busters movie. Anybody who hasn't seen the Dan Busters movie should watch it immediately after the end of this video. It's one of the best movies ever. And if, if you really want to understand British engineers, you have to watch the Dan Busters. The aspiration of every British engineer isn't actually the bouncing bomb itself. It's the bomb site that they use for the Mona Dam. It has three dowels on a triangle of wood to solve a really complex problem of speed and distance. Every British engineer wants to be that guy. And this, this desire for the appearance of effortless brilliance pervades British and particularly English culture. Um, for instance, when I was at school, we were graded according to achievement, which was A, B, C, D and E. So A was you've done very well. And we we're also graded according to effort. So one was you've tried really hard. Three is you've barely shown up. And the general feeling amongst all my colleagues, it was unspoken, but absolutely accepted, was that, to be honest, any idiot could get an A1. If you try hard, of course you can do well. The absolute aspiration was a three, because excellence without effort is a different level of genius altogether. Now, the challenge, of course, for British engineers is one that's shared across Western Europe. And the big challenge for British engineers is winning. And the problem is there's a European cultural pattern where change is primarily driven by losers. Um, hence, if you look at, for instance, at British Second World War tanks, uh, you see that the British know that they won the First World War on the battlefield and they knew how you beat the Germans. So when it comes to the Second World War, we feel, well, well we've solved warfare here. There's nothing new for us to learn. Let's do the same again. So when you look at tanks like Matilda 1, uh, and even Matilda 2, but Matilda 1 is a beautiful example of tracks that go all the way around the whole heavy, slow armoured machine gun carrying vehicle. Matilda 1 is a First World War tank reincarnated. And the best example of all, of course, is TOG 2. But TOG 2 is the ultimate First World War tank produced by the First World War design team who had nothing more to learn about the science of warfare, even though their technology had evolved considerably. So the British, the appearance of effortless brilliance absolutely underpins how the British tanks look. And the problem of, of change, the problem of winning also, you can see embedded into vehicles that produced after a period of success. So that's the British. Secondly, let's look at the Germans. Now, if you're a German engineer, you too want your engineering chums to think that you're a genius. But in Germany, this means something quite different to what it looks like in the United Kingdom. So if you're German and you're an engineer, and you want your mates to think that you're awesome, you must make something that is big, complicated, beautiful and expensive. And if it doesn't do all four of those, 
you have failed. Now, it doesn't matter what you're making. You could be making a washing machine, a refrigerator, a car or a tank. But genius looks the same in all cases. And it's big, complicated, beautiful and expensive. Look at any German vehicle and you'll see what I mean. We'll have a look at an example in a minute. But the other key feature of German engineers is they love arguably what is the most expensive word in the English language. And the most expensive word in the English language is, of course, the word properly. The Germans think the word properly is absolutely super. And the tank museum, for instance, if I know that someone says, Richard, we need to do this properly. I know that the cost has just rocketed, but the Germans love it. So if we look at some German examples, you can see how this works physically. One of my favourite features on any tank is on the Tank Museum's Panzer II, which is quite a late model Panzer II. Now think back to our Whippet. Our Whippet, we have a trouble the British engineers trying to solve of Germans targeting vision slots. So the British paint on additional vision slots to create more targets. With Panzer II, 20 years later, the Germans have an extremely similar problem. But the Germans solve that problem the German way. So if you look at the front of Panzer II in our collection, you'll see that the Germans are responding to the fact that brave, resourceful British anti-tank rifle gunners have been targeting vision slits, which are a weak point on the front of the vehicle. So the Germans come up with their solution, which is to create another target. They, they put on a dummy vision slit. But look how they do this that the Germans don't just give a tin of paint to Trooper Jones and say, get on with it, sir, son. The Germans do it properly, which means they get a proper designer and a proper manufacturer and a proper fitter, and they do it really, really well. So you have the same problem, the same thinking of solving the problem of creating more targets, but a British implementation with a tin of paint and a German imitation, which is done properly. Which is better? It depends on your perspective. Look at Tiger One if you want another great example of German engineering in action, what it produces physically. Think about Tiger One in the light of the words big, complicated, beautiful and expensive. And just look at the vehicle in that context. If there was ever a tank that did all of these, surely this is it. Now, if you're, of course, buying one tank, a Tiger One would be a great tank to buy. But when you look at this tank, yes, it's got the best gun in the world at the time. It's got the best armour in the world. It has perfectly adequate mobility. But it is an economic disaster zone. And if you want to equip an entire fleet of tanks, you've got a real problem. The, the cost of a Tiger, give or take, was about four times the cost of a Centurion the British produce uh, later in the war. The fuel consumption on a Tiger officially is uh, at four gallons to the mile, five gallons to the mile, in that sort of bracket versus an American Sherman, which is two. We think Tiger 131, incidentally, is about eight gallons to the mile, so 200 yards to the gallon. Which country has got the least petrol? Uh, the, the, the wheel design is beautiful, but if you imagine the, the logistical effort of changing wheels, of changing tracks constantly, you know, this thing is absurd economically, but it's big, complicated, beautiful and expensive. Is it the best tank? Depends what you mean by best. And in that context, let's look at the Russians. Now, we are fortunate at the Tank Museum of having an absolutely stunning T-3476 on loan to us from the Parola Armour Museum in Finland. We've had it for a couple of years now, and it's a beautiful piece. Um, if you're coming to the museum, it's one of the absolute highlights uh, that we have in the collection. It's the only one in the UK. It's one of the oldest examples of a T-34 anywhere in the world. Now, when you look at Russian equipment, particularly World War II Russian equipment, I always suggest look at the back first. And the challenge in looking at the back of any Russian Second World War tank is to find two armour plates that line up properly. 
Now, what's happening here is that the, the, the what's really valued in Russian engineering, particularly wartime Russian engineering, is brutal straightforwardness, brutal simplicity. So where the British have to be effortless, the Russians don't care what it looks like. And the Russians have an approach of problem solving where you don't go round the problem, which is what tends to be a British trade, you go through the middle of the problem. And there's a you know, famous apocryphal story uh, of American astronauts uh, using pens that had millions of dollars being developed so they can use them to write in space, as Russian cosmonauts use pencils. Probably not a proper story, but it illustrates the point that the Russians are going for straightforward simplicity. And the Russians do their tanks in the same terms. Now, you see, Russian-made cars don't necessarily sell very well around the world. So they don't necessarily look very pretty. Their tanks have been incredibly successful exports because the approach the Russians make to their tanks is to think, what's the most important thing about a tank? And the conclusion the Russians reached pretty early on was great big gun. And to be honest, if you look at Russian tanks, particularly in the Second World War, but you carry on this, you can think T-72 is a beautiful example, possibly the most successful uh, tank of the Cold War. Everything after that great big gun is a detail. Yes, the armour plates at the back don't line up very nicely, but who cares? Great big gun, taking it into battle, delivering that firepower, everything else a detail. You can see it physically in the vehicle that that's what they're after and an even nicer contrast if you look at t 3476 uh, we have it displayed opposite a panther and panther is a german response to t-34 and in panther you see that the germans while being keenly aware of the russian approach of great big gun make something that's once again big complicated beautiful and expensive and Panther, yes, it's a lovely tank, but four or five thousand of them, 40,000, probably a lot more T-34s, it turns into a numbers game. The Russians understand what that numbers game is. So you see physical differences from what each of these countries are producing as a result of what that culture is valuing. And what does this mean for us here in the 21st century. I would suggest there are two key things we probably need to bear in mind. One is particularly within military circles for soldiers, there's an inclination to fall into one of two traps. First trap is our kit is great and the other guy's kit is lousy. Uh, it's the problem you see the Germans fall into uh, in the Second World War. They assume that the Russians aren't as good as them and therefore they, their tanks are beautiful compared to Russian ones. Um, it's the same problem that the Western Allies fell into uh, in the Cold War, that we assumed that Russian equipment would be substandard. Most analyses of T-72 since the Cold War suggest that T-72 was a really, really good tank. So the first trap you can fall into is our kits, great, their stuff is rubbish. The other problem, of course, which is particularly a problem that British fall into when we're dealing with the Germans, is to say that their kit is great and our kit is lousy. And you had this inferiority complex that it, it manifests in things like that was called Tiger Terror in the Second World War, where you assume that their kit's better. Whereas actually on a macro scale, having more tanks, which was the Allied strategy uh, in the Second World War, was overwhelmingly successful. So there are two military traps you can call fall into uh, very easily and the key thing therefore for soldiers is to understand primarily what the other side are seeking to achieve with their tanks and from that to understand where it gives them an advantage but also where it comes with a corresponding disadvantage the second lesson the rest of us who are non-military in the world is it means that the argument in the pub about what the best tank is, the arguments on the forums with your mates are safe forever. Because to misquote Hitchhiker's Guide, I'm not sure we know what the question means when we say what's the best tank. And in fact, my conclusion is that the essence of the question is primarily determined by who is asking the question 
in the first place. Thank you very much. We are a charity here at the Tank Museum, so if you can support us, please do. Consider joining our Patreon scheme or becoming a member of the Friends. Any donations will go directly towards the Tank Museum and its activities.